We're beginning our new season here at the Transformation School of Ministries. We are starting a new curriculum, which will be more localized. And tonight, we were surprised that we have been able to do it on Facebook. So we'll also have it on YouTube. And we welcome you. And let's bow our heads in prayer and welcome the Holy Spirit to use Pastor Rob Finberg to minister life to us as he shares the deep, rich spiritual history that Hawaii has. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we yes, thank you Lord. for the gift of having oh, this Bible yes. school. So those of us yes. in Maui and those who are watching us yes. through Facebook and get the richness of your word, yes, we pray your anointing, Lord, to yes. be with Pastor Rob, and that you will empty him of himself so that yes. the things that he shares will be what we need to hear. And Lord, empty us of ourselves that we might hear your personalized word. So when we go from this class, we will feel like we've been commissioned by you to go out and share what we have learned. So bless our evening tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 For some of you, Pastor Ram has been your mentor, your pastor, and we welcome you. Uh, for all of us, he has been our friend. And he has been my friend for a long time. <laughs> And uh, right now, as I'm getting older and I have a lot of different responsibilities, whenever I have to travel, he has graciously filled in for me, and our people love him. And I know that you will too. Those of you who've never heard him will really love him. So I'll just turn it over to him and have him explain a little bit about what he's going to say and the happy surprises he has planned for us. God bless you, Pastor Rob. Thank you so much, Pastor Barbara. I appreciate it. Pastor Barbara and I are rapidly approaching middle age. Uh, so we are grateful. But let's be busy about the Lord's work before he returns. Yes. I took off my watch, uh, placed it on the podium to keep track. We're going to be taking a break in 50 minutes. 50 minute sections, we'll have a 10 minute break. I will announce that. We can get up, move around, however our noses, whatever's necessary, and then we will reconvene at precisely 7.30. And then we will do another 15-minute thing, and then we'll have a break, maybe some question and answers. We want to give you your money's worth. Because we're using your, your donation that you made for this, that we will uh, make sure that you get access to the snacks that are in that <laughs> new bottle. A couple of young people in my church were talking. I overheard them. One said, why does Pastor Rob take his watch off and put it on the podium? What does that mean? The other young person says, absolutely nothing. Amen. <laughs> well, we need that. But you need to hold me accountable because we have a lot of stuff to cover. I wanted to talk to you. So let me begin. Did everyone get a copy of the syllabus? Because there's a couple of things in there that I've attached that I think are very worthwhile. They're quotations. It's not my original writing. One of page two comes from Rufus Anderson. He was the secretary of the missions organization. And he wrote uh, a synopsis of what God did in the islands of Hawaii. Back then they called them the Sandwich Islands. We'll talk just briefly about that. And then on the back is one of my favorite things that I learned about. And it's a letter from Queen Ka'apumana. Long before she built the shopping center over here on Palmetto <laughs> Avenue, she had a real love of the Lord. As an adult, she learned to read and write. She wrote a beautiful, beautiful letter. This is the translation. The original, of course, was in Hawaiian. There are photographs of it. The letter still exists. But I am moved every time I read this. So I made a copy of that for you. Referring to the first page on the syllabus, breaks it down into the topics that we'll cover. We have Thursday tonight, starting at 6.30, an introduction, which I'm going to be doing, PowerPoint presentation. We're going to talk about the conditions that were present in the Christian world that gave rise to missions. We'll cover that just a little bit because you can't understand Henry Overtire's passion for ministry and missions unless you understand the context of what was going on in New England at that time and actually in the rest of the world. So we'll touch on those things. We'll talk about the two great awakenings that happened in the mainland and in England and in Scotland. The first great awakening was prior to the Revolutionary War. The second great awakening came immediately after the Revolutionary War. 
was kind of like a booster shot. Anybody get their booster shot from COVID? You don't have to raise your hands. <laughs> we don't care what people's medical background is. But I just say that because what God had done in the first great awakening was profound. But then there was a follow-up, an amazing re-emphasis of the message to transform America. So then, those two sessions happen tonight. Tomorrow night, we have a very special guest, an author who's written numerous articles about Hawaii. He was the former editor of the Garden Island newspaper in Hawaii, and he has been a student of Hawaiian history like no one else. He's recently been appointed, appointed to the board of the Mission Houses Museum. In my opinion, the most worthwhile exhibit in the entire state of Hawaii. If you're on a wall, you can take advantage of the Mission Houses Museum. It's really a great, great resource. So then, uh, I asked uh, Chris Cook, this is name, no relation to Captain Cook, but Chris Cook, if he would uh, talk about the Tahitian connection because the missions program was established in Tahiti before it really broke free in Hawaii. And the Tahitians, who speak and dialect very close to Hawaiian, were able to bring the message in greater clarity to the Aliki here in Hawaii. So he's got some great insights written widely about that. He's got two books. Uh, that are going to be available tomorrow night. He wrote the only book in 200 years about Henry Obukaya. Uh, his Hawaiian name, Obukaya. Everyone couldn't pronounce that, so they called him Obukaya. They named him Henry when he was on the boat. But he wrote this definitive book. It's a, it's a scholarly work, but very, very readable. So Chris has written that book. I've ordered several myself. It's available on Amazon. Great book, and then prepare the way about the missionaries coming to the islands. So while I'm recommending books, Chris will bring some copies if you'd like to buy them there for sale. A little bit cheaper, I think, in person than on Amazon. But I also want to recommend through Amazon a book that is familiar, uh, at least in its author, to us, Dr. Steve Walton. Steve Walton has been a chiropractor and practiced out in Lahaina, but his study overlooks the cemetery where Queen Ka'ahumanu, one of her husbands, is buried, uh, where Queen Kilpamani is buried, out there at the church in Waihei. So he has found it necessary to clarify what role the missionaries had in Hawaiian history. Now, you may have heard that the missionaries stole the land or they got rich on the on the work of the ministry and so on. None of that's true. They all died poor, landless, uh, destitute. But their hearts were here in the islands and they gave sacrificially. Their descendants, second generation, third generation, and so on, I think all of us are sophisticated enough to know that God doesn't have any grandchildren. Everybody has to be born again themselves. The fact that my children were raised in the church does not guarantee their salvation. So, uh, the missionary children sometimes did not enjoy the character and the integrity that the missionary generation had. His book is marvelous, really excellent. This is unpublished. So I talked to Dr. Walton and I said, we're doing a class, and this is the best resource I've ever come across. Years ago, he gave me a copy of the manuscript. And I said, we've got to put this in the hand. So he hastily put it on Amazon, you can get it if you have a Kindle. You can download it immediately, even tonight, and you can read this book. You will know more than I know if you digest this book and read it. It's outstanding. Again, very readable. But I printed this out because if you pay the fee on Amazon, you can get a digital copy, and then you print it out. It costs you a small fortune in copier paper and <laughs> toner, but you get to do this. And what you notice on this page, for instance, it's pretty typical, I would say 75%, from 60 to 75% of the words on this page are in italics, which means they are quoted from original sources. So when you want to know about Henry Obakaya, you read his memoirs, and he's taken Henry's own words and put them in the book. Awesome. What we have from people like uh, Michener and his book on Hawaii is we have fiction. 
And so he wrote what he thought people would be interested in hearing, and he made the missionaries seem like they were very staid and prudish and legalistic and so on. And the fact is, the lives that they lived were passionate lives. They loved the people of Hawaii passionately. And they gave themselves totally. They were, like the Apostle Paul, gladly spent for the case of the gospel. And their story is marvelous. So I want to recommend this uh, as much as I can. It costs about $20 to download it for Kindle or whatever, but it's priceless, really. This is a great, great resource. So if uh, Jesus uh, comes back tomorrow and I can't lecture, uh, at least you'll have the book. So, uh, hopefully we'll all go together. <laughs> Yeah. So what's the purpose of studying history? Uh, I don't know if you're like me, but I didn't enjoy history at all. There was no connection. I didn't appreciate history when I was in high school, when I went to college. In fact, I went into engineering so I could avoid learning a different language and I could avoid history and social science classes. So I went into electrical engineering, which was dangerous for everybody, for me, all the people went to school with me because somebody was going to get electrocuted on my watch. But when God touched my life about Hawaii and the great things he had done here, I just could not learn enough about it, about what God had done and the people he used. He used regular people. I think we hear that and we just think, well, they're not, I'm not even good enough to be called regular. We just think that they're more special than us. Absolutely not the case. We'll hear about the lives of people, some of the testimonies. These are extraordinary people. But what God did through them and with them changed the whole world. And this was the most unlikely place for anything to be broadcast to the whole world. As you know, the population of Hawaii is the most isolated population in the world. We are farther from any land mass than anywhere else is. And not only is the kingdom of Hawaii more remote, but it's remote from other islands. If God was going to do a work of grace, you would think he would like to do it in a land mass where people could walk to the next town and walk to the next town and spread the good news instead of getting on a canoe and going island to island in perilous channels and sharing the good news. It was a very unlikely place for God to manifest his glory. But he did. He did it in the most magnificent way. And the way I got involved in history and the interest that I have in studying this came about when I was minding my own business in a meeting with a missionary from New Zealand and God spoke to me. And what he said is... People will not believe what I can do because they do not know what I have done. At that time, I didn't know the name of Henry Obukaya. I didn't know Queen Ta'ahamana was a Christian. I didn't know that there was anything special done in the islands. I knew God's voice. People will not believe what I can do because they don't know what I have done. So I didn't understand what that meant. After the service was over and people were talking to the missionary, I went to somebody and I said, did God do something special in the islands? And they said, oh yeah, it was a great awakening here, a great revival. I didn't know anything about it. Now, I've lived most of my life in Hawaii. I came to Hawaii in 1973. You might think I'm Hawaiian, but I'm not. I'm from New York, Jewish, the last place on earth I ever thought I'd be is Hawaii, and the last subject that I ever thought I'd be interested in is Hawaiian history. But you see, history is really two words, isn't it? It's his story. And that's what my teachers of history really missed. There was no connection. You know, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Well, who cares what color the ocean is? Who cares 1492? Who, you know, I couldn't get any connection. But once you meet the Savior, and you realize that he raises up nations, brings down nations, 
and does a work of grace in people's life, then all of a sudden it gets very interesting. You see a consistency. You see that God has been at work in nations from the time of Daniel, of course. He said, I'm going to raise up Babylon, I'm going to bring it down. I'm going to raise up the Persians, I'm going to bring it down. He's raised up America to be a light to the whole world. Hopefully, America will respond to its calling in time before God decides to place America in some other beacon of liberty. But this is the call that we have to understand history. Why? So we can understand God. They're not separable. If you think about the Bible, it is nothing less than a history book. Everything that Jesus did is tied to history. It's different in any other religion. You can take the Hindu book, or the Tibetan Book of the Dead, or the Quran, and you cannot find any reason that that's connected to history. But when Jesus Christ was crucified in front of Pontius Pilate, and a great many witnesses, and on the third day, in front of a, a 16 Roman Marines guarding Rick, God brought him out this is a historical fact that changed the world. This is history. In fact, Jesus is more responsible than anyone for dividing our history into B.C. and A.D. That's his birth, before Christ, and Anno Domini, the of our Lord. So here is the purpose for history. So if it sounds like I'm just talking about history, let's try to remind the lecturer that it's his story. And if I get a little bit too much into the the details of the history, you correct me. You just say, ah, talk about Jesus. Okay. Is that okay? Listen, I got a wife like that. She thinks that uh, she needs to remind me sometimes what to preach on. So I, I, I've learned. I'm obedient. So I, I want to do that. Let me give you an overview of this. This is, by way of introduction, this is a PowerPoint that I've prepared for you. I want to just highlight a couple of the key people. Tomorrow night we're going to work something, maybe maybe put uh, strobe lights in here or something to, to tone this down a little bit. Can you see that all okay? You might not be able to read it, but I'll go through it and I'll point it out to you. Here we have the man that started everything in the kingdom of Hawaii, Henry Obukaia, known affectionately as Henry Obukaia. This portrait, by the way, was done by the fellow that gave us the telegraph and developed dot, dot, dash, Morse code. Anybody know who he was? Morse. That's him. Samuel F.B. Morse, who gave us that. He used to be a portrait painter. So he painted Henry's portrait and also other Hawaiians because he was in New England at the time. By the way, they were all, it's very interesting. I was back there to visit Henry's grave, and it's very near a town of Stockbridge, Massachusetts, that has a very famous museum of one of America's favorite portrait painters, Norman Rockwell. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that Norman Rockwell has hosted in his archives some of these founding documents of the Hawaiian school. And so you'll hear from Chris tomorrow about what they have recently discovered that no one even knew existed. Where? In Norman Rockwell's archives. Hawaiian diaries. Titus Cohen. Love this guy. This is not the Jewish Cohen. This is the Irish Cohen. He was a missionary to Patagonia and uh, had some success there. He was a product of the Great Awakening in America with Charles Finney. Charles Finney was renowned for his preaching. He would preach in a town for instance, he was in Rochester, New York, and he was preaching such fiery messages that everybody stopped going to work just so that they could go hear his messages. And Titus Cohen got converted, uh, genuinely born again under his ministry and his anointing, and as a result, Titus answered the call of God to be a missionary and wound up in the kingdom of Hawaii, not the first missionary trip, not the second company or the third, there were 12 companies all together, but he wound up coming here, and he had a great passion. Three months, Titus Cohen was fluent in Hawaiian. I'm not there yet. I'm not fluent in Hawaiian. Uh, it's been a lot longer than three months. But to him, 
It was all about reaching people. And when he was preaching, he would get great crowds, because, of course, they hear this pale-faced guy talking in Hawaiian, and they come here. But more importantly than that is he would spend time after his meetings, meeting with people. And he would go holly to holly, sharing the good news, whatever he could. And he made meticulous notes. So he'd say this the brother whose name was uh, whatever, Kalani or something, he'd say Kalani has uh, three children, and Kalani is a stone cutter or whatever it is, and he'd do that. So then as he passed through the Hilo district, and he'd go to the next village, and the next village, and the next village, he would come back and make rounds. And as he made rounds, he'd say, hey, Kalani. And I said, you remember my name? Oh, yeah, how are the kids? The kids? Yeah, how's your stone cutting? Wow. He had such a personal way about it that he endeared himself to people. And even Gavin Dawes, who wrote the famous Shoals of Time, a great book, he, he was so impressed with Titus Cohen's love. He said he loved his wife, he loved God, and he loved the Hawaiian people. And Gavin Dawes is not the kind of person to give out compliments to evangelical Christians. You have to recognize it. Titus Cohen was a remarkable person. Eventually, the Great Awakening that happened, he was not the originator, but he rode the wave to a tra transformation of the entire Hilo district. You know, there used to be little villages all along the coast, but his preaching and his church drew these people, and they said, we don't want to go back to our village. The fishing is good up here in Hilo, and everybody just moved. Hilo became a city around the church. Wow. And the church was the largest church in the world at that time. High School Church had 10,000 people in attendance. It was Haile Church. That was the name of the church. But Titus Cohen was the best. Haile. H-A-I-L-E. Still in existence today. It doesn't look very impressive. It's not large. You can't really even imagine 10,000 people coming here. But the people would come. It's Hawaii. They would bring grass. They would throw it down kiwi grass. And they'd sit there. And they'd, and they'd listen. And they'd up. And they turned their church into just a prayer meeting. So the building that they built to house, you know, 100 or 200 people just became... Uh, barely enough for the prayer meetings that were going on constantly mm -hmm. while he would be preaching the gospel. Remarkable guy. Queen Lulio Kalani, as you know, the last reigning monarch before she was uh, deposed and uh, the overthrow of the monarchy. That was a, a, su a subject we will not go into at all, but that was the end of the royalty reign. There were eight monarchs that ruled in Hawaii, starting with Kamehameha. He unified the islands and went through. She was the last one. The devout Christian uh, wrote hymns, taught Sunday school, uh, was a marvelous person, very loving. St. Damien. Now, our denomination doesn't uh, designate one saint above another. I'm St. Rob, St. Barbara, you know, St. Gretchen, St. Jay, you know, everybody's, everybody's a saint. Uh, writes in the Bible, uh, all of those that are born again are called to be saints. But our Catholic neighbors, they decided that this guy who came from Belgium decided to work on Molokai to care for the lepers, people that suffer from Hansen's disease. He went out there and he gave himself wholeheartedly to the care of these people. A limited budget, nobody wanted to be around these people. Very often, not only did the family uh, have to lose a brother or a sister who had Hansen's disease, but sometimes the mother, the father, the sister, the brother would join them in Molokai. And so he had a growing colony. And then there were Catholic organizations that decided they wanted to help. And so a lot of people went over to Molokai to help. There was only out of the 180 or so people that volunteered there uh, to help the people with Hansen's disease, only one got uh, infected with Hansen's disease, the leprosy. Do you know who that person was? Father Damien. Father Damien. Yeah. He got infected. And so you'll see in the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., you'll see the, what looks like a caricature because he has this big round coat, it looks like a capsule that, that's around him. Well, in fact, that is partly realistic because the sores on his body were so sensitive that he, he deliberately 
put clothing out as far as he could from him with whatever methods he had. But a remarkable person who was made into a saint not too long ago, this uh, the Catholic way of thinking, Bernice Palahi Bishop, uh, she was in line for the throne, but she decided that she wanted to give herself to uh, higher purposes, married Charles Reed Bishop, who was a banker, a wonderful guy. He came, started a little uh, mercantile business, and eventually started to do banking. And so she had some royal lands that she was entitled to, and she talked to her husband. She said, one thing I'd like to do is I'd like to have a legacy for Hawaii's children. I want them to be educated in the Christian religion, and I want them to have a good school. You know, Hawaii, commonly known, became the most literate nation in the world. And so thinking about that, she said, I want to have my will to set aside some of the land, and you can manage and so on, and that became the Bishop Trust. Mm -hmm. Now, how wealthy is the Bishop Trust? It's wealthier than the Ford Foundation. It's wealthier than the Gates Foundation. It is billions and billions of dollars. And in the charter of the school, it says, we want the Christian religion taught by Protestant teachers at our schools. So there was a prejudice against Catholicism or other religions. And so the campus that we have here on Maui, Oahu, that we got and so on, they are required to have Protestant teachers. I don't know how tightly they hold to that, but that's in the chart. And so this billions and billions of dollars uh, has uh, blessed Hawaii's children. This is Betsy Stockton. She's one of my favorite people. She was a slave, and she grew up in New Jersey. And if you're like me, you would think, oh, no, if you're a slave, you have to be born in the South. No. She was born in New Jersey and was a slave. And they decided uh, in her days that she would make a nice gift for somebody's wedding. So the people that owned her, or one of the family members, said, I'd like to give the new married couple a gift, and that is Betsy. So they gave Betsy. Uh, fortunately for Betsy and for the family, they said, we are against slavery altogether. We're not going to have any slaves uh, in our house, but we are very happy to have a new member of our family. So they took Betsy into the home. She learned to read and write. Eventually went to Princeton Theological Seminary. And she said, I want to be a missionary. And they said, well, that's it. You, know, you, you are impressive in your character. You're impressive in your learning about the Bible. But, you know, you're not married. And we're not sending single women out on the mission field. She said, well, let me make my case. And she did. She said, I want to go and preach the gospel. People taught me to read and write. They loved me. And I want to bring people that are without Christ into the knowledge of him. And I want to give my very best. So she said, I want to be a teacher. And I want to serve. So she made her case. And you know what? They accepted her. And so Betsy Stockton came. And which island do you think Betsy came to? Oh. <laughs> And she settled in behind it, not behind the Luna, but nearby, and she set up a school. And the missionary said, oh, Betsy, you came here to teach our children, not the Hawaiian children, you came to teach our kids, because we want them to read and write and learn history, geography, and that kind of thing. Well, I'm prepared to do that, but you know what? I got blessed in my life because the Stockton family gave me the opportunity to learn to read and write. And because of that, I am here. So I would like to reach the Maka Ainu, the children, the local children of the island. And they said, well, can't really argue with that. You know, here we have a woman who was formerly in slavery and so on, and she wants to, okay. She was the beginning of what became the world's finest educational system in the world. We don't think of Hawaii as being a great place for education, but it certainly must have been, because over 90% of the population could read and write in two languages. Betsy oh. Stock, a hero uh, by any stretch of imagination. After her tour of duty in the islands here, she accepted a post to go among Native Americans in Canada. So she continued to serve as a missionary 
until the end of her life. This is a photograph, actually, of Betsy that was taken after the Civil War. She posed for that when photography was a little bit more sophisticated. This is our boy Henry, again, Samuel Lippy Morse's sketch of him, telling the astonishing story of the line was radically transformed, became the most literate nation, remained sovereign during the time of imperialism. Now, I didn't pay much attention in history class, but I got brushed up on what this word imperialism was. You know, all of Europe, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Great Britain, even America, they went out and they gobbled up other countries. It was normal as they were taking sections of South America or Africa or Southeast Asia, it was normal for these powerful nations, Russia, to gobble up these countries. But you know, God's grace was upon the kingdom of Hawaii. And America, Great Britain, and so on, who normally could have, Great Britain tried to take over Hawaii, but somehow Hawaii remained its own kingdom during a very tumultuous time in American history. Now, Henry, one of the things that he did is he became, when he got born again, he went to church to church and he got excited about it. And so he would be asked to speak, share a story. Of course, he's brown skinned and so on. Now, you've got to keep in mind that New Englanders had a very different idea about civilization. There was a group of people who said, you've got to bring civilization to a group, and then, after they're civilized, bring the gospel. And people said, well, you know, that's not going to work. So there are people who said, to bring the gospel and they'll get civilized, they'll get them civilized and then bring the gospel. There was a tension about that, but underlying that in the minds of many people was, guess what? Racial prejudice. And they thought dark-skinned people weren't capable of the same spiritual conversion that fair-skinned people were. I don't know where they got that, but I mean, Jesus himself was a semi-dark-skinned person. So the, the whole idea that dark-skinned people weren't capable was a challenging thing for Henry. But Henry was a person of such stellar character and such a brilliant mind. We'll talk about that in the next section uh, after our break. That he impressed the New Englanders, and it started to dawn on key people in leadership New England said, you know what? We have to rethink this whole idea about dark-skinned people being somehow less capable of civilization or less capable of, uh, of conversion to Christianity. And Henry had a profound impact on that. People couldn't believe him. So they would come from miles around to hear he was going to be speaking at church and want to hear this, this young Hawaiian uh, visitor to talk about from the San John. So they uh, would come and they would open up their purses and in his brief lifetime, he was gone in his, his mid-twenties. He died in his mid-twenties. By that time, he had raised the equivalent of a million dollars for missions. Sometimes we go and stand in front of a group of people and he was so moved thinking about Hawaii being lost that he would just weep. He couldn't regain his composure enough to speak for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And then when he finally speak, the people just moved. And so many young people said, following meeting Henry, I want to go on the mission field. I want to give my life to Christ. Yeah. Marvelous guy. Uh, Hiram Big, a wonderful guy. Hiram uh, looks pretty typical for a missionary. Wouldn't you say? He uh, was the missionary who was kind of the head of the whole group. He and his buddy uh, Thurston. So Thurston, Asa Thurston and Hiram Bingham were the leader of the 19 people that came. And by the way, they wasn't just New Englanders who came, four Hawaiians came with them. Thomas Hopeful was one of them. You're going to hear about Thomas Hopeful, there's a new book out by none other than Pastor Kaeo DeVoit. Oh, wow. Thomas Hopeful. Thomas Hopeful was an amazing guy, but I'll let you, Pastor Kaeo, if, he, if he's got He's got some amazing things to share, so I'm working him into it. 
It's not that I'm looking to put myself out of a job. It's just these people are better than I am. So you should look forward to that. So he, uh, Hiram Bingham was a, a marvelous guy, but he was with four Hawaiians and a bunch of other New Englanders, and they came here all the way, about a six-month trip, but they came all the way around South America and out to the Sandwich Islands. Just to take 60 seconds to tell you about the Sandwich Islands, yes. you know uh, where the word sandwich came from, for the thing that we put meat between two slices of bread? The Earl of Sandwich. Now, if I was going to open a fast food place, that's the name I choose. Mm -hmm. Earl of Sandwich. <laughs> I've been on the subway, so it's the last place I want to be. <laughs> so, the Earl of Sandwich uh, was in a, in a court in England when a very strikingly handsome technician came to the court. Because you know, the London society had already gone to Tahiti, and they brought back this guy, and he caught the eye of all the ladies of the court. And they were just, oh, look at this Polynesian, he's so muscular, he's so handsome, he's so tall, look at his hair, all oh, curly. And they were, and finally, the Earl of Sanders said, we're gonna get rid of this guy. So, a young captain came along by the name of James Cook. And he said to the Earl of Sanders, Look, I'm thinking about doing an, exp uh, an expedition out into the South Pacific, and I'm looking for sponsors. And the Earl of San Francisco said, you know what? I might be interested in sponsoring on one condition. You take this Polynesian back where you came from. <laughs> Get it out of my court. <laughs> so Captain Cook said, no, I didn't have to do that. He said, okay, go them out the check. And therefore, when the islands were discovered by Captain Cook, they named it the Earl of Sandwich. And he got that name, I mean, our name for Sandwich came because he loved to gamble. He would sit at the gambling tables all day long, and he would have his meals brought to him, and his favorite meal was bread with a slab of meat on it. And that's where the word Sandwich came from. So you see now, Henry Overkayak has opened up the whole world. All of these amazing connections. So here he decides to build schools and churches, and he did that uh, with a, a, a great, an amazing family, and I'll talk just uh, briefly about that. He had, in his lifetime, seen a country that had no alphabet, no written language. He saw that go to become the most literate country in the world. It, well, he came in 1820, and when he came in 1820, there was no written language. Now, Henry was in New England. Uh, he had already passed away in 1818, but before Henry died, he had been taught to read English, and he took the phonetic letters that he could to write in Hawaiian. So Henry got very excited, and he used his new discovery of a written language in Hawaiian to translate the book of Genesis. And did he do it from English into Hawaiian? No. This brilliant young man had learned the Hebrew language, and he translated Genesis from Hebrew into Hawaiian. Unfortunately, as of today, we have not discovered Henry's translation of Genesis. But we are discovering some things you'll hear about that are pretty much that's exciting. So, uh, here he is, the grandson of Hiram Bingham, Hiram Bingham I. Hiram Bingham II became a missionary himself to the Gilbert Islands. He learned the Gilbert, uh, Gilbertese language, I guess you call it, and he translated the scripture into Gilbertese. So, Hiram Bingham II is a hero in his own right. Hiram Bingham III was not that excited about evangelism, but he was certainly excited about history and archaeology and other things. So he traveled to South America, and while he was there, he discovered an old Inca city, or I should say rediscovered, an old Inca settlement way up 14,000 feet elevation, something like that. Very rarefied air, difficult to get up there. Mm -hmm. He got up there, some of you 
you know, because he hung around with the missionary people, they said, uh, hey, you know, there's something up there. And he said, really? So he went up there, he discovered Machu Picchu. And so I met a Peruvian woman recently, and I was on the mainland, and I said, do you know who Hiram Bingham the third is? She said, yeah, he's the guy who got Machu Picchu. I said, did you know he was from Hawaii? Explorer. Well, his life was made into a movie starring Charlton Heston. And they decided they were going to get sued if they did this, so they changed their names and they turned Charlton Heston into kind of a rascal. And he made a movie, a B rated movie. It's a waste of time. I watched it in preparation for this class because, listen, I'm going to study. <laughs> so, Charlton Heston served in the book, that, what was it, The Lost Treasure of the Incas or something? And not a worthwhile movie. But there were certain pieces of the puzzle that when Spielberg saw this B Red movie, he said, you know, this could be a very exciting thing. So they made Spielberg made a movie called Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. And it is actually based on Hiram Bingham the third. And incidentally, the crystal skull is a real thing. It's discovered in, in South America. I don't know how they made a Christmas skull with a guy. Anyway, uh, Harrison Ford, the fedora, and the adventure, and so on. And Indiana Jones, who's, of course, an academic, and so on. Uh, Hiram Bingham III was a graduate of Stanford University, uh, had a degree from there, had a degree from Harvard, and was a professor at Yale. I mean, he could have done a more uh, stellar academic background. But this was, this was Hiram Bingham, married a woman who came from the Tiffany family, the Tiffany fortune, Tiffany, so uh, didn't stay married, but he loved her for a little while, a long time so. This is Hiram Bingham IV, I had the opportunity to talk with his son, Hiram Bingham IV rescued Jews from Nazi occupied Germany. So what I'm trying to say is that there was an anointing on Hiram Bingham that just came down through the generations that these people were people, people, who gave themselves to be world changers and see if they could help people. So Hiram being the fourth, uh, he worked for the FDR administration during World War II, and being in Nazi-occupied France and Marseille, he started to write out visas for Jewish people. Uh, some people like Marc Chagall, Hannah Arendt. These people are, if you're familiar with their work, and it's, it's impressive. They owe their life to Hiram Bingham the fourth. Here he is on a commemorative stamp. And I do this, I say this because when God shows up, there are, there are blessings on top of blessings on top of blessings. There's creativity, there's heroism, there's added blessings, there's all kinds of things that, that you just say, this is God's life here on earth. It impacts everything. We've had revivals that we talk about them. Uh, what was it Brownsville revival? I attended there. I went to Toronto, the Toronto revival. And I can tell you, neither in the Pensacola revival. They, they're okay. But they start and they end. It doesn't affect education, it doesn't affect government, it doesn't affect the society as a whole. When I was in Pensacola, we went into the church service, and I passed a couple of guys. I said, what are you guys doing here? He says, we're security. I said, security? Yeah, we watch the parking lot, make sure that vandalism and theft doesn't happen. And I'm thinking, how different it is when God genuinely shows up. I mean, there was never, there was no security forces at the world's largest church. There was just God's presence. It was just the reality of God. People would tremble mm -hmm. at the service. It was such fear of God. Mm -hmm. Amazing thing. So, okay. Here's a great story. Chiefest copy line. This is an actual silhouette done of her. She's kind of a stout woman. She loved the Lord about three years after she was introduced to Jesus Christ. She realized that she was showing the missionaries around. She went up to Kilauea. Uh, and she noticed these colonies were coming here and they grabbed the forbidden berries. They, you know, snap on them and so on. Whoa, you can't do that. Anyways, she kind of watched it. Years later, she said, a few years later, she said, you know what? 
Cain is no God. Only God is God. Jehovah is God. Jesus, he's our Lord. This Pele that has people in bondage, in superstition and fear, this has to be confronted. So she traveled from the Kona side all the way over to the Hilo side, to the volcano park, to Kilauea, and she took the berries that were forbidden, and she said, as she stood at the brink of the caldera and threw the berries in, she said, family, come and get me. <laughs> Who does that sound like? <laughs> Elijah. The prophets of Baal, right? And she said, come and get me, and you don't have nothing now. And she said, Jesus is Lord. There is no way. Courageous woman. This was such an impressive story that Alfred Lord Tennyson, the poet laureate of Great Britain, wrote a poem about her. And it's worthwhile reading. You can find it online. But if you're good and you behave yourself tonight, I will print some up for the distribute tomorrow. Great little poem, about uh, 24 verses. Okay? Uh, this is what Pastor Tengen brought up. This is the man that gave the world basketball. He grew up in Hawaii, third generation. His father was a missionary, and his grandfather was a missionary. He grew up in Hawaii. But for health reasons, went to the mainland. While he was there, got a medical degree. And his health came back. He became a physical fitness expert. He worked for an organization known as the YMCA. Have you ever seen the YMCA and the logo, you know, that triangle? That was his design. He came from Hawaii. Well, they signed him to a place in Springfield, Massachusetts, and there he came upon his first real winter, and he said, well, what are we going to do for physical fitness during the winter? And they said, well, you can't go outside. So he talked to his assistant, a Canadian by the name of James Naismith, and he said, you know what we need to do to maintain physical fitness with our young people? We need to come up with an indoor game. So he said to Naismith, I want you to to emphasize that it can be played by boys and girls, that it has a lot of cardio in it, has a lot of coordination, and see what you can come up with. And Jim Naismith asked the assistant to this alliance, said, okay, I came up with something. I got a soccer ball, and I got some peach baskets, and I'm putting them 10 feet up in the air, and they gotta go, and they gotta put the soccer ball in the peach basket. In those days, they didn't cut out the bottom of the peach basket. So guess what the score of the first game was? How'd they get the second one? <laughs> one to zero. That was it. The game was over. And somebody, who's got the ladder? Nobody's got the ladder. Okay, let's cut the bottom of it. So anyway, that's the birth of basketball. Yeah. This was why? Because this man grew up in a place where outdoors can be enjoyed 365 days a year. Now, basketball has become probably the most universally appreciated game, even more than soccer. And so, Miles Tower County told me that. He said it's, it just takes, it just takes a, a, any kind of neighborhood, any kind of place, you don't need a great deal of space, you play basketball. And it is taking the world by storm. It's not the only sport that Hawaii uh, gifted to the world. Here's the banker I referred to, Charles Reed Bishop. This guy looks like he should sell crop caps. <laughs> Here is uh, America's Most Famous Saint. Here's Betsy Stockton I've talked about. Here's Dwight Baldwin. I've included this down here. Historians say that he saved the wine race from extinction. He was a medical school dropout. Didn't quite finish because the boat was leaving for the Sandwich Islands, and he said, I want to be there. I want to be a missionary. I want to be a medical missionary. They said, well, your final exams at Harvard Medical School don't happen for another few weeks. He said, I can't wait. And so he didn't really have an official medical degree. But he did have all the training that was necessary. He understood quarantine. He understood uh, vaccination. He understood other things. And because he came, and which island did he come to? No. And because he came, he uh, trained Hawaiians in vaccination. They went everywhere. Hawaiians were being vaccinated. So when smallpox was killing hundreds, thousands of people 
On Maui, they virtually had no deaths, almost none. About 250 fatalities, as far as they can estimate, happened in smallpox where other islands that did not have his medical skill and training available. He trained doctors, he did all kinds of things to make uh, medical services available. He did a great job. Here is Meha uh, Meha. Can you turn off the light just for one second in this section here? I want you all to see this. This is a portrait done by a Russian portrait painter by the name of Chorus. And Chorus painted him accurately. So King Kameha Meha wore what he knew a Russian sailing officer would wear. And he was a brilliant man and a diplomat, so he had in his wardrobe all these different costumes, and he would sit in the, the clothing that he expected his guests to, to be comfortable with. So this is not a fabrication. They didn't put clothes on to make him look like a Westerner. They did this, but Chorus painted him accurately. That was the role that they had. You know, the pictures were up a thousand words, so they had people write, they had records of things, but they also had artists on board. Of course, painted to make a man of the great. And look at this. This is an enlargement. What do you see here? Blue eyes. Blue eyes. Okay, we put the light back on. Kamehameha had blue eyes. He was seven foot tall, blue eyes. He had superhuman agility. The stories are that several people would throw spears at him simultaneously and he would capture the spears or move and so on. He was seven foot tall. Mm -hmm. How do we know that? Because his cape is still around with us. And the feather cape would not be dragged on the ground. So they know from the shoulder height of the cape that he was seven foot tall in stature. That's his name. Aya, Aya was his real name. He took on the name Kamehameha. There was a, an attempt on his life as a young man because he was in line for the throne. And so his uncle tried to have him killed and he was whisked away and raised by someone else. Actually, he was raised by the one of the chiefs. And so he uh, lived his life and they gave him the name Kamehameha because he was uh, set apart. Or it could be interpreted the lonely one, the very lonely one. So Kamehameha means the very lonely, lonely one. But his birth name was uh, Aya. Well, okay, I was wondering if that upper name was the translation, or like, so it's the other way around. The other way around. Kamehameha is, is translated the lonely one or the one set apart. Here's the famous Nahe stone. Uh, Naha, the Naha stone was connected to the Naha family. And the Naha family would take their children and they'd place it on the rock that the children were calm and so on. They would somehow connect it to uh, some privileges and so on and so forth. But there was a prophecy that went with the Naha stone, and that was if anyone could lift it, that they were going to unify the islands. And the story is that Kamehameha, at 14 years old, lifted the Naha stone. Now, this is the real stone. This is in front of, if I hadn't put that banner up there and described it, that's the Hilo Library. You go over to Hilo Library and you can see this. There's the Naha Stone, and this is also a part of it. It actually originally came from Hawaii. But anyway, they brought it over there, and they, um, and he lifted it, and they all went, oh, he's the guy, he's going to be the unifier, and sure enough, he was. Now, some people have a problem with the fact that there's prophecy outside of the Christian influence, but... The fact is, there have always been prophets uh, that have spoken truth. And so uh, Hawaiian history, pre-Christians and so on, had a great deal of prophecy involved in it. Kapehi is uh, one of the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, is one of the most renowned prophets to be referred to that. Here's the conclusion of what happened in the uh, middle of the Great Awakening. The pinnacle of the Great Awakening was 1837-1838. Now, do you remember what year the missionaries first arrived? 1820. So this was 16, 17 years after the missionaries arrived when things broke loose. Up until then, up until the 
32, there's only about 600 born again Hawaiian Christians. And that's sprinkled across all the islands. So it wasn't like there was a great move of God. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go further. But this is uh, an amazing thing because the saturation of the understanding of God's word is such that when Kamehameha III drafted a constitution, he had this in the preamble. Anybody see this okay? Yeah. That no law shall be enacted which is at variance with the word of the Lord Jehovah or at variance with the general spirit of his word. Imagine if the U.S. Constitution had that rephrase. <laughs> Wouldn't have so many of the contemporary issues that we have. <laughs> And then later, the Constitution says, all laws of the island shall be in consistency with the general spirit of God's law. I thought this was profoundly wise also. It, doesn't, it wasn't a theocracy. They understood that the greatest commandment was to love God, and the second great commandment, like it, is to love your neighbor as yourself. So the, gen, the spirit of God's law is not the, the, the enactment of rules and regulations. It's about love. So... Uh, I love that idea. So let's talk uh, in our next uh, section about the antecedents to the uh, missions program, but we are now coming up to our time for the end of the uh, 50 minutes. So I can entertain a couple of questions, and I'll we'll take a break. We'll stand up, and we'll use the power room, whatever you want. Uh, is there any question, anything like that? Yes. Yes, Committee on Ed Schools, yes. And that, that's in the charter of uh, uh, Bernice Kalani. So, uh, and she does require Protestant teachers. Yes? When they say questions, could you repeat the questions for the... Oh, for the, uh, for the Facebook thing. So the question is, with the Bishop Trust, was it Committee on Ed School, was it always uh, sponsored? for the purpose of Christian education, uh, as I understand. Yes. yes? I hope this is a frivolous, but who homeschool on Oahu, not the Kamehameha, but it's not both. Is that uh, related in any way to religion? Punahou. Oh, Punahou, yes. Yeah. All the schools were, yes, Punahou. Yeah. Yes. Because, you know, Kamehameha, but, but the Punahou, in a religious context yes. with There's another school over there, the Royal School, which was done expressly for the children of royalty. Uh, and that's over there in Honolulu as well. But yes, all the schools, everything was organized around their faith. Okay. So, very true. Okay, please. Can you just briefly go over again how um, Chief Fis Kapiolani, when she took the berries, why the berries and where does she throw it? Yes, uh, I didn't bring pictures of that on my slide thing, but I do have pictures that know what the berries are. Um, I, rather than give you wrong information, I'll just call them the berries. But they were forbidden berries, no one could eat them. But she had witnessed these uh, outsiders, these non Hawaiians, eating them because they just thought if they're there in the bush, let's eat them, we're hungry. And she thought, you know, lightning's going to strike or not. It didn't. So when she went back, she said, you know, I, 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 I felt that it's, there's nothing to this alien superstition. So that's why she defied it. And so there were two things. One was to, to go and pick the sacred berries and then, of course, to throw it into Paley's living room, you know, the Alcane. And she challenged it. And, and she was warned. There were people that stopped her all along her journey. It was a long trip, as you know, from going to the Hilo side. And they, Priestess and the uh, priests of Pele would come, they wanted you to die. So, uh, it's deeply interesting. Okay? Let's take a break. Okay? We will carry on.